Well, what I'd like us to do, this would be a little bit different because just like Romans 9, Romans 10 is saturated with Scripture. I told you last week that because Paul is dealing specifically with the problem of Jewish unbelief, he's gonna, he makes a very explicit Old Testament case for what God is up to in, is, in Jewish present unbelief and then their future hope uh, of being uh, called and, and gathered uh, into uh, God's people through, through faith in the Messiah. And so, uh, to understand Romans 10, you need to be aware of the way that Paul is using uh, old, the Old Testament. And so, uh, and, and here's a principle for studying all Scripture in New Testament, but especially Paul. When you're reading in Paul and you come across what, in my, in my translation of the Bible, my, uh, often Old Testament quotations will be capitalized. Is that the way it is in, in your Bibles? They'll actually be, they'll be capitalized or highlighted somehow? Am I, the, am I the only one with the Bible like this? All right. Uh, like if you look in Romans 9, 29, is your, does your Bible somehow indicate an Old Testament quote? 9, 9 29. All right, gives quotes. Okay, sometimes it's all caps. Here's my point. Anytime you run into or your, or your text reminds you that, that Paul is either quoting directly from the Old Testament or is he, he's giving a, a strong allusion to Old Testament, you ought to stop, look up the Old Testament text, and read the whole chapter. Because you'll find that not only it's, it's Paul's habit often, not merely to be making a point about that specific verse, but he's really using the whole logic of a chapter, and he has all of that in mind as he's arranging his material. So if you'll, if you'll kind of read uh, and, and, and get familiar with what's going on in that Old Testament text, you'll find that it matches up with what's going on uh, in his particular argument. All right, so will someone... Uh, agree. Uh, I need somebody to look. And these are in the notes. If you'll see uh, point two letter B, I need somebody to just look up Isaiah 8, 14. And when I tell you a little later, I'm going to have you read that aloud. Isaiah 8, 14. Anybody want to volunteer for Isaiah 8, 14? Not everybody. Okay. I've got, yes, I have someone in the back. All right. Thank you, uh, Amelia. And then Isaiah 28, 16. Would somebody take Isaiah 28, 16 to read aloud? Mm -hmm. Isaiah what? 28, 16. Not, not, not yet, but when I call on you. All right. Okay. Isaiah 28, 16. And then Deuteronomy 30. And this is, this is several verses. Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. Okay, all right, thank you, sir. And then Leviticus 18, 5. I promise this does not have anything about warts or mildew. Okay, it's a, it's a good one. So it's, it doesn't have any of those surprises in it. Leviticus 18, 5. Anybody want to read Leviticus 18? Five, Frank, thank you. And Joel 2, Joel 2, 26 through 27, and then verse 32, Joel 2. Uh, thank you. You're brave enough to find Joel in your, in your Bible. That's right, so thank you. I want to... Yes, Joel 2, 26 and 27, and then verse 32. And I'll remind you again when we get to it. Let's see, is that, is that everything? Okay, that'll be good. And so one of the things I want you to see in that, even in this one chapter, there is, there is Old Testament Scripture running all the way through it. All right? And so, uh, if you remember... Last week we tackled Romans 9, one of, the, one of the most challenging chapters in all of the Scripture, in which Paul is making a very specific case as he builds the entire argument of Romans 9, 10, and 11. You cannot understand Romans 9 if you don't understand how it functions within the whole argument, which is Romans 9, 10, and 11. What Paul is doing in Romans 9 is he's laying out how God does not and has never planned to save Jews how God has not planned to save Jews. Now, it's kind of a 
interesting question, right? Maybe not one that you were, were worrying about today. How, does, how doesn't God save Jews? But it's a relevant question because the, the major issue is, for the letter, why aren't the Jews responding to the gospel? That's the big question that Paul is dealing with. Why aren't the Jews responding to the gospel? And then there's a practical missional application. If Jews really are no longer responding to the gospel, something's changed. God's changed his mind or he's decided to move on. But there's been a theological shift and Jews aren't, aren't, aren't really amenable to the gospel anymore, then missionally, why bother going to them? Why bother pursuing Jews if the, answer's, the only answer you get is no? And typically, when Jews said no to the gospel in the first century, how did they say no? Did they say, no, thank you? What did, how did they say no? No! They shouted and threw things and called the police and created trouble and got the, got the Roman authorities wound up. And so Paul wants to come to Rome so he can go all the way to Spain and share the gospel with everyone, Jew first. And the Roman church perhaps is not so fired up about getting involved in that. They're not sure if they're interested in a Jew first approach to evangelism. Okay? So, and one of those assumptions is that... Um, Somehow God has failed to keep up his promises because he's not saving the Jews. If the Jews are God's special genetic people and the Jews are God's special people because of the law, then God must be duty bound to save the, save the um, genetic relatives of Abraham. God should save them because they're a special people and God should save these people who, who follow the Torah. Now, is that how God saves? No. No. But that's how God used to save uh, Israel. That's how, that, that used to be how God did it. No. no, Paul's point, he takes us all the way back to the beginning of Israel's history to remind everybody, God has never saved a Jewish person simply on the basis of their genetics because he didn't save Ishmael and he didn't save Esau. Okay, so he's making the case that's, not only is that not the case now, God has never intended to save Israel according to genetics or according to Torah obedience. From the very beginning, and this takes us all the way back to Abraham, how did God save the first Jew? Which is by faith. That's Paul. This is not new. This is old. Was Abraham circumcised when he came into the covenant? No. That, that, that happened, that call and response happened even before circumcision. And so, Romans 9, how God does not save. And then right at the end of Romans 9, and we'll look at this together, Paul starts to unveil how God does save. If God doesn't save by who you're related to, and God doesn't save by what you do, how does God save? By faith. By faith. And we're back around to Romans chapter 1, justification by faith. And so, the Israel did not believe. They did not believe. Gentiles who did not pursue a law of righteousness, but they believe in the Messiah, they're, they're in, the, in the covenant. And, and Israel who does have the law, but pursues a law, a law of righteousness, a, a righteous through the law, rather than the righteousness of faith, they miss uh, salvation. So um, uh, Paul will move how God does not save in Romans 10. He's going to really lay out very specifically how God does save. That, by the way, is why we love Romans 10 so much. You've heard sermons on Romans 10, and we quote Romans 10, 9 and 10 when we share the gospel, and it is, it is a crystal clear, full-throated announcement of how God does save. And it is rightly applied as an encouragement to evangelism for all people at all times. But don't forget, specifically in the argument of the, of the letter to the Romans, when Paul talks about how will they know unless they hear, how will they hear unless someone preaches to them, what group is Paul specifically talking about in the argument of the letter? Who's he talking about preaching to and taking the gospel to? Jews. Jews. We're going to keep preaching this gospel to people that 
are assumed won't, won't say yes. They're, 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 they're hardened and they're, they're resistant and they, they don't want to say yes to Jesus. And there's, there's a, a, all kinds of reasons not to pursue them. But Paul says we're going to take the gospel to, peop, to, to, uh, to these Jews who are, who, who, who are refusing to believe. Okay? So, and then, this is, we, won't, we won't spend any time on this tonight. But uh, another thing to see how the whole uh, argument of Romans interlocks is if you... And this is especially the case when you read Romans 10 and Romans 3. So I just think one of the cool things about how Paul's mind works is Romans 2 goes with Romans 9, and Romans 3 goes with Romans 10, and Romans 4 goes with Romans 11. And so Paul will, Paul will in, uh, introduce these ideas in the early part of the letter, and then he'll answer them and speak to them specifically in the latter part of the letter. Anybody know... Or can you remember any important verses from Romans 3? Well, what's Romans 3.23? Can you get it? I'm re- I'm yeah, go, go ahead. Oh, got, anybody know what Romans 3.23 says? I don't know. I'm hitting you, Cole. What is Romans? It's, a, it's one of the most famous. It's, it's a John 3.16 kind of verse. Very good. Woo! Right? Amen. Hallelujah. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then we... And then how does it keep on going? Eh. Here's my point. In Romans 3, you had this... You had this... You had this... In Romans 3.21, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has all of a sudden shown up. Humans couldn't do it. Israel couldn't do it, and now Jesus shows up and does for us what we can't do for ourselves, and He pays the price that we couldn't pay by being a propitiation for our sins. And so you have this very clear announcement of, of the gospel and of what Christ has done for us in Romans 3. You have it again in Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised from the dead. You will be saved. And so you see how, uh, how Paul is sort of building and, and, uh, and recapitulating these arguments for us. Uh, and so, just like Romans 9 is an evangelism, I'm mean, just like Romans 3 is an evangelism chapter, so Romans 10 is an evangelism chapter. Okay, so, so let's, let's dive in. The summary of the problem, uh, the, there's, the, there's the problem of God's righteousness and Jewish unbelief. And so I'm going to read Romans, uh, because the argument of Romans 10 really starts at the end of Romans 9, verse 30. What shall we say then? And any time Paul says, what shall we say then? He means, okay, let's take a breath. Pick your head back up. Let's, let's, let's take a survey of where, we're, where we've been and then where we're headed. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, Jewish people, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works, They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them. For who? In verse 1, my prayer for them. Jews. Jews. My prayer for them. Just like at the verse first verses of Romans 9. I have unceasing anguish in my heart that my kinsmen according to the flesh won't come to faith. So he picks this idea back up. My heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. And then here's a little theological note I want you to get. I realize I'm throwing a lot at you at one time. If Romans 9 is talking about how God has decided not to save some people, because that, that is the reformed argument. Romans 9 tells us how God has this group and they are hardened. They are vessels of wrath. They, uh, the, they are um, hated. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And so if Paul's making the argument that there's this group of people that God's just decided not to save, then why does he say in Romans 10.1, I'm praying for their salvation if they can't be saved? All right? Once again, it's because I don't think Paul is making the argument in Romans 9 that that, re- that Reformed theologians think he's making. All right, but I digress. All right, so 
Verse 2, For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according with knowledge. For, no, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So once again, we're reminded of this surprise. The surprise is the unrighteous Gentiles are now righteous by faith. And the righteous Jews, I put these in scare quotes, the righteous Jews, those who everyone assumed was righteous, in meeting the standard, declared, these are my people, the righteous Jews are unrighteous by works of the Torah. And so this thing that, that seems unexpected to us suddenly makes its appear, appearance. But it's not a surprise because the Bible always said this was going to be the case. And so then we have these quotes. Who's got Isaiah 8, 14? So read it out loud. He will be a sanctuary, but for the two houses of Israel, he will be a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over, and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Okay, so in Romans 8, 14, Paul sees this allusion to a stone of stumbling. That, that this, is, this is the Lord, and you, you would have thought this would have been a foundation stone to build on, but for Israel... He has now become a stone of stumbling. And that stone word gets Paul to thinking and thinking through different verses in Isaiah. And it makes him jump in his mind to Isaiah 28, 16. Who's got Isaiah 28, 16? So this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Isaiah, sign, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. Very good. So, and then, then look at the way Paul qu quotes these verses. He starts off, Behold, I lay, a, a lay in Zion a stone. That starts with Isaiah 28, 16. And then in the middle of that, he, he's got this stone idea in his mind, and he puts Isaiah, the Isaiah 8 verse in the middle, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And then he picks Romans 28, 16 back up, and so it's got a He's got an Isaiah quote, and then he sticks another Isaiah quote in the midst of it to tie these ideas together, that, that the very thing upon which the people of God were going to be built has become the thing that Israel has tripped over. Okay? Uh, and, and here's his point. The Old Testament tells us that Israel would stumble over the thing that rescued everyone else. It's a surprise that it's, the, it's it sounds surprising to us because you would have thought Israel would have responded positively to the stone of salvation. But instead, they've tripped over it. And why have they tripped? First of all, who's the stumbling stone? What's the stumbling stone? Jesus is the stumbling stone. They've tripped over Jesus. And why have they tripped over Jesus? Did he perceive that he would come as he did? Okay, this, he's not the Messiah they were looking for. And then, re, then, then always catch these illusions. I think Paul very purposefully is using this idea of pursuing. What is the idea of pursuing? It gives you an idea they're running, they're chasing, they're in motion. And what were they running after? What are they pursuing? The, the text tells us, what are they running after? Torah. The Torah, right? They're running after the Torah. What's the problem with, what's the, problem with the pursuit of Torah? You, you just, you're. And so it's a picture they're running to catch up with Torah, and Jesus is standing between them and Torah saying, you, 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 I'm what you're looking for. I fulfilled Torah, and you can come into me, but they just ran over the top of him. And if you've ever been to Israel, you'll know that it's filled with rocks. And uh, if you go to Israel, you're going to fall down at some point because everybody falls down in Israel all the time because there are stumbling stones everywhere. All right, especially if you get a little speed picked up. And so I found that when people, including myself, fall in Israel, they go sprawling. They trip and, and, and it's a Scooby-Doo, you know, uh, uh, fall flat on your face sort of thing. And so it's not a surprise. Here's the point. It's not a surprise that Jews have tripped over Jesus in their pursuit of Torah. And, and that's really the, it's a summary of the argument that Paul has made in Romans 9. So it's not a surprise that the cornerstone is a stumbling stone. 
the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, right? You know, that's, that's my, that's my uh, 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 Psalm 118 that I re, I'm re-memorizing it all the time. I, I memorize it, and then I let two weeks go by, and then I can't remember any of it. So don't worry if you have trouble memorizing Scripture because I'm, I'm, it's always going in and falling out. But Rome, uh, Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is it's marvelous in our sight. You know what the next verse is? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And isn't it crazy that all that is right there together? It should have been, yay, here's Jesus, yay. But instead, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, the, it's the stone that everyone wanted to get rid of. Okay? So, and this is Paul's story. Did, did anybody, did I have anybody look up Philippians 3? I'll, 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 I'll grab it. Philippians 3. Can I get there fast? Apparently not. All right. Philippians, Philippians 3. Now, now, now listen. For I, here's what Paul says in chapter 10, verse 2. For I testify about them, these stumbling and falling over Jesus' Jews, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the, to the righteousness of of God, and then here's what Paul says about himself in Romans uh, three, uh, verse four. Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, verse five, circumcised on the eighth day, nation of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which is uh, in the law, found blameless. Um, and then he speaks, I think, in oh Romans nine and. He says, I want to be found in Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, that which is, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. See how many allusions between Romans 10, 3 and 4, or, or 2 and 3, and Paul's own testimony about himself. The zealous, pursuing a righteousness of his own, uh, pursuing the law, and that was Paul's story, running a thousand miles an hour in pursuit of what he thought the proper goal was, only to discover he was persecuting Jesus and at cross purposes with the, with the gospel of God. So, uh, and, I, and I also love the idea, and it's, it don't, don't miss this, how do you think Jews would have, been, ha, have felt about Paul highlighting the fact that they were ignorant? What did, what did Jews pride, pride themselves on in distinction to Gentiles? And we, we have memory. Paul had, it's very likely that Paul had most, if not all, of the Old Testament memorized. He just, he just, he had studied it so much. And what did Jews think about the intellectual prowess of Gentiles? That they were the ignorant ones. They were ignorant. But, so Paul is really kind of ironic here that Paul would say the main problem with, with Jewish people is that they're ignorant of the things of God because they claim to know, uh, know everything. This, by the way, is an argument that Paul is making in Romans 2. But, but I'll, I'll keep going. So it's not a surprise because this is what the Old Testament has told us it's going to be. It's not a surprise because this is how Paul used to be. And then... The center of, I have this in, in, in letter D, the center of gravity of, the, of this passage shifts from God's sovereignty in Romans 9 in salvation and, and unsalvation to human responsibility. Here is the point at which Paul is really beginning to highlight how God does save, and he does save by faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus, all right? Faith in the Messiah is going to be how anyone and everyone can be saved. So there's this shift in, in the center of gravity from sovereignty in Romans 9 and God's decision on, on He's the one who gets to decide how people are saved. And then the, uh, a shift from that to in Romans 10, how the sovereign God has decided to save people and how has the sovereign God decided He's going to save people? By faith in Jesus, okay? Uh, he's going he's gonna to call for them to respond to the, to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And then there's also this continual shifting all the way to the end of the story. Again, verse 4 of chapter 10, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And that word end or telos, it means conclusion, completion, fulfillment, goal. That's also why I think Paul has his Philippians 3 testimony because Paul says what Paul's goals change in Philippians 3. His goal was pursuing right, the, the law. And then what does Paul say? He's, what's his goal in Philippians 3 once he meets, once his life has changed? I press on to the goal of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Christ has now become his goal. And, and I think Paul, Paul has that in mind. So not only are we at the end of the end of, at the goal, but also Paul's going to take us to actually, and this, this, this is why you keep studying the Bible, because I learned this today when I was putting this lecture. I'd never thought about it before. What place in the Pentateuch or in the Torah does Deuteronomy occupy? What place in the Torah? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the telos of the law. The last book of the law. All right? And then the, um, and, and Ryan, I got copies of notes there and here. So there's one on this table and one next to Daniel up here. So Paul's going to take us to the actual end of the law. He's going to take us to Deuteronomy, and he's going to take us to the end of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses is getting ready to die. He is given his last words. He's summarizing all of Israel's history, and he's also going to tell uh, uh, the future. He's going to go ahead and prophesy about Israel's future. And it's, you ought, you ought to read Romans, I mean, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 30, 31, because Here's what Moses is going to say in Deuteronomy 30. And I'll have some, uh, who's, who's got Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14? Don't read it just yet. Because what Paul will say at the, in Deuteronomy 29 and into 30 is, hey, y'all, here's what's going to happen. God's going to bring you into this land. He's giving you this law, and he's giving you all of these promises and, and land flowing with milk and honey and his, his blessing uh, over it. But here's what y'all are going to do. You're going to worship other idols, and you're going to provoke the Lord, and He's going to give you lots of time to get it straight, and He's going to send you lots of people to help straighten you out, and you're just going to say, no, 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 until what has to happen to them? Curse. They're, they fall under God's curse, and how is how that manifested in Israel's history? Okay, exile. exile. And so all the way before they even go in, Moses is telling them, you're going to get kicked out. But... Even though you get kicked out, your God, just like he didn't forget about you in Egypt, he's not going to forget about you in the countries where he sent you. And so something's going to happen in these faraway countries. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. Go ahead, Larry. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep his commandments that I commanded you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord your God takes delight in prospering you as he took delight in your father. When you obey the voice of the Lord your God and keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in, in this book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it down to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we, that we may hear it and do it? And then read for verse 14. For the word is very near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart, 
so that you can do it. Very good. Now, in many ways, the rest of Romans 10 is going to be controlled, and it's almost an exegesis and application of, of especially verses 11 through 14 of Deuteronomy 30. And so Paul's taking us all the way to the end. Now, there's all kinds of evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls and from intertestamental literature. Jewish people thought about the last chapters of Deuteronomy all the time. And they thought especially about Deuteronomy 30. And they asked, when is this going to happen? They knew what it was to be in exile. They knew that even though they had returned to the land, the Romans were still in charge and people were still, the diaspora was all over the place. And so they still knew that this prophecy of Moses still had not been fulfilled. The people had not come back. The people were not prospering in the land. And there was not this obedience from the heart. Did you hear that word heart? It's no longer going to be external. But now you're going to be obeying and something's going to happen to your heart. And you're going to have a word. And what's the word going to be? Instead of an external word, what kind of word is it going to be? A word that's near to you. And what is it? It's in your heart and in your mouth. So, if you're, so keep that in mind because in Romans 10, 9 and 10, you're going to be told what? If you can, if you what? <coughs> Confess with your mouth and believe in your Okay, the reason why Paul, because here's what people do. Okay, so you've got to say some words with your mouth while you're thinking about it in your heart, and that's how you, how you get saved. That's not, <laughs> you do need to do that, but that's not Paul's mechanics of how, you know, the formula for how to get saved. He's saying this is that Jesus and, and the, the hearing and, and responding to the gospel is the fulfillment of, of Deuteronomy 30. There was going to be a day when the word was going to come near, so near to you that it's in your heart and in your mouth. And so when people, Jews and Gentiles, hear the gospel, and they're, you remember when you got saved? Did something happen in your heart? Yeah. Uh, did, and then did something come out of your mouth? Yeah. And when something happens to your heart and something comes out of your mouth because of, because of Christ for you, the promise of God from Deuteronomy 30 is fulfilled. And the promise is no matter how y'all screwed it up, and run the wrong direction and gotten lost and are way off track, I will find you through my son and I will call you back to myself and this word of mine will, will, will transform you. And Jews had been asking, what time will this be? And what will this word be? And so in, um, in the uh, intertestamental period, I think it's 2 Baruch, it's wisdom. 2 Baruch says that it's wisdom is this word. And so we're going to find this divine and new wisdom that's going to, that's going to, rescue God's people and bring God's people back. In the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, it's, they, it's a reflection on Deuteronomy 30, and it's going to be this new special temple law for a new special temple that God's going to bring, not in Jerusalem, but He's going to bring it down in the, uh, out there in the desert. And when people follow this new temple law, their hearts and mouths are going to be changed. And Paul is saying, eh, it's not going to be this special hidden wisdom it's not going to be a new law that comes out of heaven for the temple. No, no, no. This word is what? What's, what's the word that saves? Jesus. Jesus. Who is the new temple and the new law and then the thing that everything has been pointing to? That which Israel has been waiting on since Moses. That which Israel has been waiting on since before they went into the land has been fulfilled. This is, this is not a surprise or new or some deviation from the plan because Israel as plan A did not work. This was the plan all along, all along. And so Paul takes us all the way to the end of the story, the telos of the law, the last book of the Bible, but also the end and the thing to which the law is pointing. What Paul will say in Galatians is the law is a tutor that brings us to Christ. All that is in Paul's mind. I say this all the time. That's why Paul's a genius, because he has 25 different thoughts in his mind at the same time that he all has integrated, and we have to sit here and take an hour and talk about them so, we, so our minds can wrap around them. Okay? And so this end of Deuteronomy is the, is the transformed heart 
through the Word. That no longer is it going to be external law following or external because you look like a Jew or identify as a Jew, but it's going to be a transformation from the inside. And what makes a true Jew? This is also the point that Paul has been making for eight chapters. That a Jew is circumcised in the heart. Not new, old, always. What characterized the true Jew is the Jew whose heart, a Jew whose heart is circumcised. And so Paul is recapitulating that argument and then getting ready to set up how that's going to be applied. So he moves from the summary uh, uh, of the problem to a summary of the solution. If, if God is God's righteousness, if God's righteousness, which is Him staying faithful to His plan, is actually on display in the unbelief of Jews. But Jewish unbelief is a problem. Oh my goodness, we're preaching the gospel to Jews and they don't respond. What is the solution? Now I believe that the, that the Gentile Roman solution to Jewish unbelief, what, what do Gentile Romans want to do about the fact that Jews are resistant to the gospel? You just forget about it. Give up. It's over for them. Don't bother. But Paul says, let's keep reading the scriptures and let's do what God says. Let's follow God's plan when it comes to Jewish, Jewish unbelief. And he takes us again and he's, and he's, he's going to flesh out uh, uh, Deuteronomy 30 in chapters 5 through 13. So, for Moses writes, Paul does not want us to miss it. Uh, he's talking about Moses and he's talking about what Moses is saying uh, in the last chapters of Deuteronomy. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law uh, uh, shall live by that righteousness. Who has Leviticus 18.5? Frank, if you'll give us Leviticus 18.5. Uh, keep my statutes and ordinances a person will live if he does them, I am the Lord. There you go. All you got to do to live and to enjoy the, the fellowship with the Lord is what? What? All you got, what you got to do? You got to keep the law. So y'all are dismissed tonight. Go and keep the law. Is that, is that, is that exciting good news for everybody? Yeah. What's the problem with Leviticus 18:5? We won't keep it. We won't keep it. And that's the and that's the internal problem of Romans and, and, and all of Paul's gospel. So the law points out our sin, points out our, our inability to fulfill it and it piles sin up. It makes sin more sinful by making it explicit. God has said explicitly what He wants us to do and we say, no way, I'm not going to do it. <clears throat> so, so, Paul recapitulates this point that Paul, that Moses, the, 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 the law giver, tells us how the law works. If you want the law to bring life to you, all you have to do is keep it. But if you don't keep the law, what does the law bring? It brings death. It becomes, a, it becomes a word of death. But the righteousness based on faith, and hear the echo of Romans 3, 21, 22, 23, and, and beyond, but the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. And then he's going to, he's going to quote Moses. He's not intend to, intending to point out that, that he's found some kind of contradiction in Moses. He's just saying... Moses told us this was how it was going to work. Moses is the one who says in Leviticus, do the law and live. Then he tells us in the, in the last part of Deuteronomy, the problem is you guys aren't going to do the law, but the story's not over. And Moses keeps on going. And, and the, but the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows, and this is quoting Moses from Deuteronomy 30, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, who will bring Christ down. So, Paul is given a Christological interpretation of this Old Testament verse. That is, who will bring Christ down? Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, who will, uh, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. This again is a quote from Deuteronomy 30. The word is near to you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the Scripture says, whoever believes in Him will not be disappointed. 
And, and he's pulling back in that, the same quote from, Romans, um, from, from Isaiah 28. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is the Lord of all, abounding in riches, riches for all who call on Him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Paul's going to move us from the end of the Torah to the end of the Scriptures because he's bringing us to the, to the culmination of the, of the prophetic word. Let's watch how he does that uh, together. So um, do this and live. That's uh, Leviticus um, 18.5. It uh, also Ezekiel 20. Um, all, kind of all the way through Ezekiel 20 will hammer through this idea, do this and live, do it and live, don't do it and die. Uh, and then, and then the uh, righteousness is by faith is Deuteronomy 3, 11 through 14, which Larry already read. And so after exile, death, and end, there's new life in return. And uh, this is happening through the, through, uh, the Messiah. So we have a, a messianic interpretation of Deuteronomy 30. The word of Christ is near. It's, coming, it's, it's come down out of heaven. It's come up from the grave. Uh, it's resulted in new life. Uh, and it's received uh, with, an, with the heart and the expression of the mouth. Okay? And let me stop there. Everybody following me at that point? Right? So Jesus the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 30. And, um, and so the stumbling stone of 933 is now the cornerstone to the Jews who are, who are uh, no longer ashamed. So we get to the uh, verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be, and ashamed is a better translation than disappointed, will not be ashamed. This idea of shame takes us all the way back to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 7. What's, where does... Where does what rings your bell about ashamed from Romans 1, 16 and 17? Don't look. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Let's keep going. Can you do the rest of it? For it's the power of God unto salvation for them who believe the Jew first and also the Greek. Um, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For just as the scripture says, the just shall live by faith. Now isn't it cool that Paul can, he's always got these things weaving together, breeding them together. And so there's no longer any shame. They're not going to be disappointed or ashamed uh, because uh, that which was promised has been delivered through uh, that which has been promised in Deuteronomy 30 has been delivered through the Messiah. So you have the gospel, power of God and salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek for the just shall live by faith. This has been the plan. This has been the plan all along. Jews and Gentiles saved the same way. And how are Jews and Gentiles saved? Faith in Jesus. By faith in the Jewish Messiah. Now, that's, yes, Yes. So they, they studied all these books that were like interpreting everything. Didn't anybody pick up on the upside down kingdom? You know, it's there in the Old Testament. You know, because like this concept of shame, that's such a strong word mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about someone who's supposed to be your Messiah. Yeah, so, I. Right, right. I, I think, and that, it's, that's a good observation because it captures really the, the, the original dynamic of the letter. How can they miss it? How have they missed it? How have the Jews missed it? It's, it's right from, and here's, the, and, and here's what Paul would say. How did I miss it? I knew the Old Testament upside down and right side up and forwards and backwards and everything in between believe myself to be 
in pursuit of it. Here's a thought, and, and I think this is this uh, a case can be made about uh, about the Pharisaic Judaism of Paul's day. Is they had developed. You ever heard the term the canon within the canon? You you develop your the text that you like, and then you just leave out the texts that you don't like or don't really really fit your system. And so, in Paul's day, the Pharisaism of Paul's day, they uh, it was about Torah. We have this set of things that we're supposed to adhere to that make us distinct from the nations. This is how God's going to be able to find us when He comes in judgment, is we're going to look a certain way and we'll be very distinct from the nations. And it's, it's really the job of Jewish people to follow Torah, especially the Torah that distinguishes us from the nations. Because we hate the nations, God hates the nations, they've treated us so bad, and when judgment comes, God is going to do what to Israel and what to the nations? He's going to elevate Israel, and what is He going to do to the nations? Smash them. They like those ideas. But if you go all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 12, what was God's plan concerning the nations? That all the families of the earth would find a blessing in Abraham's seed. And so part of why they miss it is they, they lost the plot. To us, right. So it's also the thing... But how can Israel miss it? Well, I got to tell you, after pastoring for 25 years, we're pretty good at missing the obvious. All right? Or we continually emphasize certain that, That's correct. That's correct. And um, uh, we have, uh, what's it called? Um, bias confirmation. We have, <laughs> we have what we're, we tilt towards, and then we find evidence for the things that we, 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 for, for we, want, that we want to focus on. And we arrange things so we don't have to interact with, with the things that make us more uncomfortable. So there is a propensity to be blind to the truth. And uh, that was certainly on uh, what was going on here with, uh, with the Jews. So, um, and then Paul has this idea of shame and he picks that idea up. So he's thinking about shame and he's thinking about the gospel. He's thinking about the stumbling stone that's down the cornerstone. All that's floating around. And then Joel 2, 26 and 27. Michelle, I think that's you. Joel 2, 26 and 27 is what he quotes here. Yep. And then in Joel 2.32, which is what he quotes. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Very good. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here's what a, he's, so Paul has shame. He has the stumbling stone that's become the cornerstone. He has whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And all that's going on in Joel and Isaiah. Uh, and he, he links these ideas together intertextually so that, so that he makes this argument that, that now that the promises of God have been fulfilled through the Messiah, Israel no longer has to be ashamed or embarrassed or disappointed that God didn't come through for them, but he's come through for them in this way. Because the same way that Joel talks about not being ashamed, he also talks about whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And, and again, in this messianic interpretation, who is the Lord? Who's Yahweh? Who's the Lord? In, Jesus is the Lord. Very good. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the reason we're not ashamed. Jesus is the reason Jews can be saved. Jesus is the reason that God has kept His promises. And so all of these Old Testament uh, promises have been fulfilled in one place, in one way. And it's done so in a way that Israel has had now, Israel's salvation has been made manifest. But God's plan for saving Israel was so that He could do what to the nations? 
be a light, rescue the nations. And so God's big plan to have a great Jew-Gentile family has all come to pass. That includes both Jews and Gentiles, which is why suddenly this idea reappears uh, in, in verse 12 of chapter 10. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on the name of the Lord. For Paul, the, the salvation of Jews and Gentiles is the expression of the promise-keeping nature of the gospel. This again goes all the way back to chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to save Jews and Gentiles. Please don't miss that. We tend to, we tend to very much individualize. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. Yay! We all know that verse. And it is. It's the power of God to save Eric. But for Paul, the greatest manifestation of the saving power of the gospel is it saves the people you think are going to get saved and it saves the people you don't think will ever get saved. It saves the people who are far off as well as saving the people who are near. And its ability to do that and then to call very different people together into the same family, that's what lets the world know something completely new is going on here. And so when the good news is, is preached, it's proclaimed uh, to those who look like they would respond to it and those who don't. And it creates churches filled with people who look like they belong and have it all together and, and people who don't look like they belong and don't look like they have it all together. And so um, the, the solution to the problem of Jewish unbelief is the proclamation of the gospel that's powerful enough and promised to save. So then we have the application of this solution. If the gospel is powerful enough to save unbelieving Jews, what then should we do? Verse 14, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful uh, are the feet of those who bring good news uh, of good things. I didn't have anybody look up Isaiah 52, 7. But if you want to know what the gospel means and why the, the word gospel is used in the New Testament, it comes from Isaiah 52, 7. That's where gospel good news comes from, is Isaiah 52, 7. And we see good news in the context of announcement, proclamation. Often when we talk about the gospel, we talk about the gospel's content. And we need to be clear on what the gospel's content is. There, there are ways to make up false gospels, right? Inauthentic, counterfeit gospel. So we need to know the content of the gospel. But we never need to lose, sometimes we can get so interested in the content of the gospel that we spend our energy making sure we've carefully delineated it and we forget to proclaim it. Good news makes you want to share it. That's the nature of good news, right? When something really good happens to you, what do you do? What's your response? Right. And even if just something really great happens to you and you're just sitting in your chair watching a football game and something really good happens on the screen, what do you do? You make a noise. Hey, you can't help it. You just make him inarticulate. We, we're just wired up to blah, say something about it. That's how you ought to feel about Jesus and the gospel. You can't, it's, it's, what the, it's what the apostles say in Acts 4 when the Sanhedrin says, you're really going to have to be quiet about Jesus. They say, we actually can't help it. Thank you for giving us the right to remain silent. We lack the capacity to remain silent. We can't not talk about this Jesus. And so you do what you got to do, and we're going to do what we can't help doing. Because good news, by its nature, is shared. If it isn't shared, then it isn't good news to you. And that, that needs to hit you. If you're not sharing it, you don't really think it's that good. And, and, and for Paul, I'm telling you, he could not, not share, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel, is how, is how Paul felt about it. And so, and so, oh, so the application of the, of the solution. Um, 
And then, however, they did not uh, all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So we, we get to the practical payload of this letter. Paul wants to be sent out of Rome to the rest of the world that has not yet heard the gospel. And I think he says it in Romans, I, I don't want to preach the gospel where it's already been preached. I feel like my specific assignment as an apostle is to, is to take the gospel to places where it's never been heard before. And we've really kind of done the work here in the East, and there are churches now that, that can be tasked with sharing it with everybody in the Eastern part of the empire. So I want to go West where no one's heard the gospel. But I, um, and I want the Roman church to send me to do it. But, you can send me, I'll preach the gospel to everyone, but how will Paul do it? When he goes into a new village or town, he's going to go to the Jew first. He's going to go to the synagogue first. And the Roman Christians might have a little quibble with that, but Paul says this is how the, 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 the mission is done. So, how can they call on him and whom they not believed? How can they believe in whom they not heard? How can they hear unless, they, unless there's a preacher? How can there be a preacher unless someone is sent? It's just also so nifty to see that, that gospel churches are sending churches all the way to day one. It's what, it's what characterizes a, a, a New Testament church is they are churches who send, send, send. And Paul expected to be sent and he needed to be sent. That's the missionary task of the church. So, uh, you get the, then you get this. Let me, let me just give you a little summary. So, Deuteronomy 30's word will now come near to people in the Western Empire through Paul, and this word will call for them to believe. He'll announce this good news, they'll hear this good news, and they'll be stirred to respond uh, uh, to the good news that Jesus Jesus is Lord. And by the way, Jesus is Lord is a, is a very, very succinct definition of the gospel. The good news is that Jesus is Lord. And so let's, let's pull that apart for just a second. Why, why is Jesus is Lord good news in the first, in the first century to, to these hearers? Because he's the I am. Okay, because he's the I am. All right. And again, pull that apart for me a little bit. Right. That to go redeem the people in Egypt. Okay. He says, who shall I say send me? He says, I am. The I am sent me. So you have this identification of Jesus of Nazareth, this, this single person in whom the fullness of, of, of God dwells. So this Lord, Yahweh, who through the rebelliousness of Israel left the building, the king has returned. Yahweh has come back, and he's come back to do what he said he's going to do. This thing we've been waiting for has finally happened. All right? So Jesus as Lord means, means the God of Israel uh, has, has finally come back to do what he's promised to do. In the Roman Empire, who is Lord? Who is Curia? Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord is the... Uh, proper political speech. And to the Roman rulers, Caesar as Lord was the gospel. Good news, everybody. Caesar's in charge now. <laughs> and if you don't like it. And so the Romans thought Caesar as Lord is good news, but everybody else thought that that was what kind of news? Bad news. Right? It's, it's the heel of a boot or the boot through your front door with Caesar as Lord. And so they wanted to be rescued from that. They wanted to be set free from that. And it was a very, very uh, controversial thing to say somebody else besides Caesar is Lord, but Jesus really is Lord. He's, he's, he's Lord. He's Israel's Lord, and he's the Lord of the whole world, and he's the Lord who's come and has the power to set people free. And when Gentile people heard the gospel, it did to them what it does when we have evangelistic events now. And you'll see this person who's lived a life of licentious rebellion, pursuing pleasure, 
doing what they want to do. They've messed up their lives. Uh, they got all these things against them. And then they'll hear somebody tell the story of, of, of Jesus' death and resurrection for them. And what often happens when these hard-hearted hard sinners, rebels, people who have hated God and always done what they wanted to do, what often happens when these people hear the gospel? They, they say, yes, that's the answer that I've been looking for. And they're changed. They're changed. They must be changed. And so that's what Paul says that, that, that uh, he wants to do. And it's a, it's a reprise through Paul's experience. Paul is saying, I'm going to still go and preach to all people, including resistant Jews. And I'm going to call them for belief. And even when they refuse to believe, I'm going to still keep preaching the gospel to them and keep pursuing them because Jesus kept pursuing me. Jesus kept looking for me. And he never gave up on me. And at the right time, his good news brought, brought, th broke through to me and I answered uh, that call. And so, and then this little unexpected turn, verse 18, but I say surely they've never, but I say surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and all their words to the end of the earth. That, that's Psalm 19. It's how the, 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 the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. That's Psalm 19. And this is a little part of it that, that Paul is quoting. The, and this really goes all the way back to Romans chapter 1. The, the uh, people have had, had access to, to the glory of God and to the truth of God that's in, in creation. They, they don't have a, an excuse and Israel's the same way. They've heard the word of the Lord. But, but I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and said, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Now, why in the world is... Paul going back to this. He's just made the case in Romans 10, anyone who hears the gospel can be saved, even Israel. And then he says, but a lot of these Jews have heard the gospel and they've been, been resentful. And he remakes the argument from, from Roman nine, Romans 9 that God said all along Israel would be resistant like this. Why, what's, what's Paul up to? Well, let me see if I can lay it out to you. Um, in the present... This preaching that Paul wants to do will, pro will produce a world-saving resistance to the gospel. This resistance of the Jews right now in the present is going to be what God uses to save the world and the Jews. So we go back to Moses and back to the, the telos of the law, the end of the law, and he quotes out of Deuteronomy 32, 21. This is in the Song of Moses. And Moses is, again, he's right reciting the history of Israel. And he says, here's what's going to happen. You guys are going to mess it all up. And uh, I'm going to pick a nation uh, other than you. Uh, you promote, provoke me to jealousy. And I'm going to pick another nation. And that's going to provoke you to jealousy. Um, this jealousy motif is going to appear then in Romans chapter 11 as almost the final piece of Paul's argument about how God is using Jewish resistance and Gentile receptivity. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, well, I'll just, I'll just lay it out to you now. Paul's argument from Romans 9, 10, and 11 is God is going to use the present resistance of Jews to drive the gospel to the Gentiles. So many Gentiles then are going to get saved that at a point in the future, that incoming of the Gentiles is going to cause Jewish peoples to be jealous of that salvation. And they're going to begin to respond positively to the gospel and all Israel will be saved. Okay, so that's, that's going to be Paul's theological, ultimate theological ex explanation for present Jewish resistance to the gospel. Then he takes us to the end of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah has 66 chapters, and Paul takes us all the way to Isaiah 65 uh, and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me uh, while uh, Israel continues to be uh, an obstinate people. 
And so, if you read Isaiah 65 and 66, that's in the last part of, of, of Isaiah, and there's a lot of new creation discussion. It's really telling about how God's going to finish out this plan after exile. And so what Isaiah says is right before the new creation comes, there's going to be sort of this rebellion of the Jewish people. They're, they're, uh, they're going to be obstinate uh, and hard-hearted, and God's going to be um, found by a, a people who did not seek me uh, and did not ask for me. Paul's point in reminding Israel of this is to say, so it's not unexpected that here in the last days there is still this ongoing Jewish uh, resistance, but God's not finished with them yet. Um, those who weren't looking for me, the Gentiles, are finding me, and, and then as a result of the jealousy that that provokes, uh, then Israel will come in. All right, so what Paul's doing then at the end of Romans 10 is he's setting up this argument for Romans 11. Now, I see the looks on your faces, okay, that Paul's making the argument that present Jewish unbelief leads to Gentile salvation that will provoke jealousy at the proper time. And that seems like kind of an, does anybody think that sounds like an odd argument to be making? It's a. Yeah. Yeah. Is this a supernatural thing? Well, there you go. So I would I would say this. It's a it's an unusual argument to be making. To me, it sounds unusual that the plan is for Gentile salvation to make Jewish people jealous. And they're so jealous and feel left out that they, they all get saved at the at the end. Okay, does that sound a little do what? You know, and we, we were the chosen people or whatever. It seems like some, a, a, maybe a, a slightly negative argument to make about how, how they get saved. But let's not, I don't, I don't think Paul would want us to overpress all of the details out of this. Here's what the Apostle Paul has been tasked with doing. He, along with others, notice that Jewish people aren't saying yes to the gospel. And he's going to search the scriptures to find out why that is and what God's plans for are in it. And God directs him to these Old Testament scriptures that say there's going to be a present hardening that results in an ultimate end gathering. And that's the, that's the point that Paul is making. It's a, it's a um, what's the term that I'm looking for? Um, the, it's, a, it's a theodicy argument. Do you know what the word theodicy? Are you familiar with theodicy? Theodicy is uh, why God lets bad things happen to good people. Right? That's, and, how, and, and really theodicy means how can we understand God to be righteous when evil happens? And so what Paul is... is, is and, well, and so give me, give me some of the answers that the Bible gives for why God lets bad things happen. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Okay. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. All right. For his glory. For his glory. All right. And how, how does that work? That God's glory manifests through the suffering of, of the righteous. There you go. There you go. And, and I'm, I'm setting this up, and I, I mean for it to be simpler than I'm making it. The great revelation of Scripture is that God has found a way to work through human evil to bring about great good and salvation. Yes? And that that's the message of the cross. That God has allowed the greatest evil to fall upon His wonderful Son in order to bring about a great salvation. That's right. And it, I mean, it just, just looked like all was lost. In the same way, then, Paul discovers through the Old Testament scriptures that this sad thing that's happening to, the, to God's people, which seems bad and it's hard to understand the fairness of it and it's hard to make out why God would do it this way, Paul's making the same argument 
that this God who always takes the things that we've messed up and, and works it to, to His glory and to our good, He's doing the same thing through present Jewish resistance. And he sort of and he gives us some illustrations from the Old Testament about how God's planning on doing that. All right? And he's figured out a way to do it because that's what God always does. Therefore, we're going to keep preaching the gospel to them because God doesn't give up no matter how evil we behave. And so it's, it's a carefully constructed Old Testament textual argument that's, that's complex in many ways, but it's making a very simple point. That the God of the Bible is the God who's always finding a way to use our resistance to, to bring about an even greater salvation. And so aren't, I wouldn't say, or I was going to ask it, are you glad? I don't think anybody's glad for Jewish resistance, but aren't you glad that God found a way to save us Gentiles? Yes. yes. And that He is going to He's going to be faithful to his covenant with Israel. He's, going to, he's, he's made a way to do it. And we've got to trust him with the timetable and the process. And there's some mysteries with it. But he's proven that he can be trusted to bring about his good purposes. In the same way he let his own son bear a heavy load for the rest of it, so he lets Israel bear a heavy load for the rest of us. So like, like baby Samuel died. Exactly. And so here's what I already know about baby Samuel dying, which, which we would not have chosen for Mary Payne. We wouldn't, we wouldn't choose it for ourselves. If, and that's why God doesn't ask us, because we would always say no to assignments like that. But we already know of people's lives being transformed because of baby Samuel. We already know of nurses being touched and family members hearing the gospel and, and, and churches being, being stirred uh, with the Spirit through baby Samuel's life. And it's very likely that baby Samuel will, will do more for the kingdom in his two days that he was outside the womb than a lot of people do with their whole lifetime. Uh, the, the, the old Puritans called it a hard providence. All right? And there are hard providences. And this is a hard providence. But um, God in His manifest wisdom um, found the best way. And, and we have to trust Him with it. And we have to keep doing what we've been asked to do even when we kind of don't understand it, even when it's difficult. And so when Paul walks into, and there's a, there's a part of me that thinks Paul made it to Spain. You can make different arguments about whether or not Paul actually got out of Rome and got to Spain, but an argument can be made that he actually got to Spain. And I think the reason Paul wanted to go to Spain specifically is because there was such a Jewish, there was already a Jewish presence in Spain. There's a lot of history that the Jews made it to, to Spain. So there were a lot of good synagogues and there were a lot of good footholds for the gospel. And so uh, I see Paul walking into, I don't, I don't know if Madrid was Madrid in the first century. I doubt it. Okay, but whatever city was there before it was called Madrid. And you see the Apostle Paul walking into that city and asking around and, and, and finding out, uh, hey, where's the, is there a synagogue? Do I got a synagogue here? And they, yeah, it's two blocks that way and three blocks over there. And uh, on, the, on the Sabbath day, <coughs> makes his way down there and sits down. And there's a men are on one side, women on the other. And the rabbi stands up and he gives a little teaching. And then he says, oh, there's, is there anyone else with the word? And Paul says, I'm a, I'm a rabbi from... Uh, uh, from Jerusalem, uh, and uh, yes, I have a, I have a reading. Can I have Isaiah scroll? And let's let's turn to fifty three. And let me let me give an interp an interpretation of Isaiah fifty three for you. And and let the games begin. All right, and maybe they listen with interest at first. This this text that tells us of one who is going to come and be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and, and we've never quite known what to do with that verse and he's the one who's going to be a sin offering for us uh, uh, the one who's going to um, uh, take our place well I know who that is it's a it's a, it's a rabbi who came to us who rose up in, uh, out of Nazareth and he died and rose again 
and I, I have, I've talked to him. And everything you've been waiting for is now, it's, all these promises have now been fulfilled in Jesus. And they listen, and maybe they listen for the next Sabbath, and maybe they listen for the next Sabbath, but by the time the fourth Sabbath or so rolls around, they realize that for, if Jesus is Lord, then everything changes. If Jesus is Lord, then what the law means has now been interpreted in him, and, and, and everything will have to be redefined in terms of Christ. And that's not good news to a lot of them. And so there's yelling, and there's anger, and there's arguments, and maybe some furniture gets thrown, and Paul gets grabbed by the scruff of the neck and, and hauled out to the edge of the city. Maybe he gets hit with some stones, or maybe he just gets hit with fists. And he's laying there, just like he was, I think he was in Lystra. Remember, they stone him in Lystra. And I, and I think he's dead. Uh, this is probably not a good reference. Y'all, anybody ever watched Blues Brothers? Remember Blues Brothers when they blow up the building and the Blues Brothers are under the rubble and then they, they climb up out of it and get in the police car and drive off? Uh, okay. I, I sort of have that picture of Paul after they've stoned him in Lystra, okay? But he gets up out of those stones and he dusts himself off and everybody thinks he's dead and there's Timothy. He meets Timothy in Lystra. And Timothy is this, he's half Jewish, half Greek. He's, 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 not, a, he's not a Jew. And the stoning in Lystra is how Paul finds Timothy. And I think that's Paul. What, when he landed wherever the synagogue chucked him, then he would get up and look around for the next Gentile. And he'd be like, yep, that's him. And the resistance of the Jews would drive him to the Gentile. The man of peace that Jesus spoke about when he sent his, his people out, and there he is, and, and now Lystra has been reached for the gospel, and we're on to the next, we're on to the next place. And so he's in Madrid, they chuck him out of the synagogue after four or five weeks, stands up, and there's some Spanish Gentile with some questions, and, and the gospel goes, and there it is at the ends, ends of the earth in Spain. And, and Paul says, yes. I've taken some beatings, and I've taken some lashings, and I've been in jail, and I've been shipwrecked, and I've been out on the open sea, and I've been in danger, uh, and they almost killed me a couple of times. They beat me so bad, and it's made me weak. I'm sick a lot. My eyes don't work, and, and I don't feel good most of the time, but the weaker I get, the more Christ is, is, is made manifest in me, and uh, my light shines even brighter. Uh, and, 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 and people from among the Gentiles and the Jews get saved. And so we're just going to keep on doing it this way. It's a hard task, but it's a good task. And it's the, it's the task that changes the world. And so we're going to keep preaching, is, is Paul's point. So the application is this. this is, Romans 10 is a missions passage. The churches must send missionaries to preach. I sure do get tired of us talking about all the people around the world that don't know Jesus. We got all this right here in Fairhope. Blah, 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 blah. Don't say that. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world, that's where the work is done, and we send them everywhere. And as soon as you hear the word send, you're saying yes if you love Jesus. Yes, fair hope needs Jesus. Anybody give an amen on yes, fair hope needs Jesus? Yeah. Amen. Does America need Jesus? Yeah. Maybe more than it ever has, okay? And, and there are huge pockets of under, and, and it needs to be reached. And so does India, and so does Turkey, and so does China, and so does, and God can get everybody everywhere, and there's enough people and enough money and enough resources to take the gospel to the world ten times over if God's people would do it. And so when, when uh, the call to send is heard, Romans 10 people say, let's go. Hearing the gospel can open any heart to redemption. We preach the gospel to everyone, everywhere. And we need to get good and we need to be careful because we now live in a culture with a lot of people who hate Jesus, they hate the things of God, they hate truth, and on and on and on and on. And as a result, we hate them. Oh, that is not what the Bible says to do. What does the Bible say to do? We love them. 
I love you. I know you want to spit in my face, and I love you anyway. I know you want to tear up <laughs> the world. We're going to find a way to love you. And, uh, yes? And how about that strategy when we're weak, when we're strong? Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. that's a hard one to... You're right, and and look, I I uh, I, I like feeling strong. I like, I like my 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 disposition is to operate to operate from a position of strength. Christianity with big muscles, even though I don't have big muscles, but Christianity with big muscles is what is how I think we ought to do it. When you ask Eric, fleshly Eric, how stuff ought to be done. But that's not what the Bible says for us to do. And it, and it, I would rather impose my will on someone than lay my life down. I would rather impose my will on someone than serve them and wash their feet like Jesus did. But what we know is that kind of love breaks the power of Satan. It always does. It can't be killed. The more we serve, love, sacrifice, lay our lives down, the more Satan is defeated, 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 defeated. He, he, he can't. And how do we know Satan can't kill that? Because Jesus. Jesus rose again from the dead. He couldn't kill Jesus. And he, he, can't, he, 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 and he can't kill anything that, that, that Jesus has to do with. And so then finally, confession and belief in the Lordship of Jesus Christ saves sinners. It's not that complicated. It doesn't mean it's easy, and it doesn't mean it needs to be dumbed down. But what we call people to do is this, to confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart the content of the gospel that he's raised again from the dead. It's not a fairy tale. It's not made up. But Jesus really did rise again. There's a, there's a historical, a theological core to what we preach that it's not, it's not pick what you like. But it's a radical claim that a dead man is alive again and a radical claim that this dead man who's alive again is also God and Lord of the earth. But when someone confesses that with their mouth and believes it in their heart, what happens to them? They get saved. Well, what if they're drug dealers? They're still saved. What if they're uh, uh, a part of the LGBTQ community? They're still saved. What if they've uh, embezzled $20 billion? They're still saved. Now, we've got a lot of stuff to work through. But they don't have to do 25 things or pay, but pay it all back or whatever it is. They just have to believe the Lord Jesus Christ and what the Bible says about him and they're saved. And so this is the gospel we proclaim to anyone who will listen. Well, I've covered about as much ground as anybody should have to stand. And so uh, thank you for being here tonight. I'll pro- uh, yes, sir. We know there's a lot of unsafe people in this country, this world. But I'm really concerned, and I think one of our biggest challenge is how about all of these quote unquote people who strongly believe they're Christians, but are living a non-Christian life, abortions, LGBTQ. Yet if you ask them, they'll tell you they're saved, they believe in Jesus. They're Christians. How do we do that? Yeah, I, I, we need the gospel every day. Eric Hankins needs to be, the gospel needs to be preached to me every day to remind me. Because there's, so there are Christians who drift. Well, kind of like Paul had to tell the Jews. Yeah, that's right. And, we got to tell folks in the South. You know, I believe just he's been involved in. That, that's right. Well, and Paul had to send Timothy to his church in Ephesus and they've gotten, they've gotten the, the, eye, the, the cart's in the ditch. We've got to get in there. So, so it's, I think it's two-pronged. I think one is we can't just assume that, that people are Christians. We, we have to engage them about that. And, and this is another topic for another day, but there's been a, there's been a lack of discipline in the, in the body to, to call struggling drifting believers to, to pursue them and call them back to robust faith. Some of it is, a, is frankly a, a um, failure to disciple. 
I don't think we've done a very good job at discipling new believers, so they, they don't learn the faith. Um, I think sometimes we don't teach very good. And so I always want to encourage you who've, who've been tasked to teach, to teach God's Word, don't be boring, don't be meandering, don't study 15 minutes before you, you teach. Uh, uh, people's faiths are depending on uh, your level of preparation and, and, and excellence in your communication. So we can do better on the inside so that we can do better on the outside. Well, let me pray for you, and I'll, I'll let you get going. Father, thank you for Romans 10. Uh, Romans 10 is the reason I had a chance to hear that Jesus is Lord. And so if we really say we believe it, uh, then we're going to be a people who are all about the word going forth, coming near to those who are far off. Help us to see that clearly in the days to come in Jesus' name. Amen.